Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Sober times, aren't they, really, at the moment? You know, in James 4, I think it is, it says that we have we, we have wars because men lust after things and they can't get them. And James is a little bit like an Old Testament prophet. I'm a terror for keeping things in my Bible. Slips of paper and things. But it talks about we lust for things and we can't get them and so we fight. Of course the devil uses those things as well. He uses what he knows is in us to bring about his, his will if he can. You know, the fact that God is in control doesn't mean that the devil doesn't try. So don't be surprised at these things happening. Something I wrote a long time ago and I've read out here before, but I want to read it again. You know, I like, I like to write little pieces. Can I help you? asked the voice. I looked round. There was an angel seated behind a desk and above his head was a sign saying the angelic help desk. Do you have a query? Well, yes, I replied hesitantly. Why did Jesus say that there will be wars and rumours of wars before he returned to earth? Ah, said the angel. It's because people can't spell. Pardon, I said, feeling rather confused. It's because they spell the word grace wrongly, he continued. Grace is what people need to live together. There's no alternative. And without it, you have wars, individual or national. You see, people tend to spell it rights. Everyone wants to receive grace, but wants to get rights. Is there any hope then, I asked rather despondently. Oh yes, he replied, but you have to visit the prayer desk for that. Where can I find that, I queried, hope rising. He pointed. Through that little door marked humility over there. But it's small, so you have to go through it on your knees. That's it. <laughs> if you would turn with me to Acts chapter 4. We have to pray a lot about wars and things that go on. In Acts 4, we're introduced to a man who's destined to play a vital role in the establishment of the church as a world force through evangelism. He's a man who's not a household name amongst the 12 apostles. He's not a writer of New Testament truth. Yet he was always available to God at the right time, spiritually alert to the moving of the Spirit, even amongst those who were called by Paul of more reputation, even when they were unsure of themselves. He was the man who was a connecting link in God's plan to take out for himself, as the scripture says, God taking out for himself a people from amongst the Gentiles. That's a lovely phrase. His name was Joseph, and he was a Cypriot, and he was a Jew. He was a Levite, and he was a landlord in Jerusalem. And he's a man who'd been transformed, his life and his vocation, everything about him, sometime during those exciting days following Pentecost. Now, you might be racking your brain thinking, who is this? Well, you might know him better as the name Barnabas. And I want to look at Barnabas maybe over the next couple of times that I preach because he's a vitally important man. I can, you can't stress that more. But in Acts chapter 4, uh, we're gonna, I want to read verse 36 to 37, but I'm going to read a couple of verses before that in my usual way. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. Let me explain something. 
lots and lots of people had come for the Feast of Pentecost, the Jewish Feast of Pentecost. They got more than they bargained for because the Holy Spirit came and fell on the disciples, the apostles, and we have uh, the Acts 2 situation. And it says there that many people got saved. Now, a lot of these people were visitors. They'd come from far away and they were visiting. So they presumably had made accommodation um, arrangements and all these things. But here they were staying on. They weren't just there for the few days of Pentecost. They wanted to stay on. And the more that God did, the more they wanted to stay and more people were added. So the church was made up of people who lived in Jerusalem and people who lived in Israel and people who had come from the diaspora all around the world. And so there were loads of them there and they believed and they were of one heart and soul. And the way they dealt with it then was they claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property. So they pooled their resources. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. But all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sale and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each as any had need. So they had this communal living there for this period of time. It's not a pattern for the whole church forever. It's something that God did at that particular time. Now, verse 36. Now, Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the, by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the mark of a man. That's what I'm talking about, the mark of a man. And I'll go on uh, later on in other times to deal with some of the things. If you follow Barnabas through the Acts of the Apostles, you will be amazed at just how much influence he had. Tremendous influence. But he came, he was a Levite landlord, he sold some property, and he came and he brought the money and he laid it at the Apostles' feet. A nice phrase there. Gave it to the Apostles. Use it as you will. Do, do what you will with it. Well, how did he do it? Well, first of all, he did it in great simplicity. There's no fanfare. You know, Jesus talked about the, the prayer of the, and the fasting of the Pharisees, how they would come, sound a trumpet. They paid someone to sound a trumpet so they could give their money or say that I'm fasting. And Jesus said, that's all right. They've had their reward. That's what they wanted. They've had their reward. But you, when you fast and pray, you don't let your left hand know what the right hand's doing and such things as this. He did it with great simplicity. He came and he gave the money to the apostles and said, here, use it as you will. We don't know if it's a little amount or a large amount. We have no idea. But the first thing he did was he did it in great simplicity. And God deals with us in simplicity. He doesn't make things complicated. When you find Christianity gets very, very complicated, stop and say, Lord, what? I'm missing the point here somewhere because you deal with us in simplicity. The second thing he did was he did it in great sincerity. Here was a man who'd been touched by God and his response was a simple, sincere reaction. I love to see that when God touches someone and they just simply, sincerely do that which God says. And that's what Barnabas did. And the third thing was with great self-sacrifice. If it doesn't cost you anything, it, you know, if someone gives me something and I give it away, it's not really cost me anything. There's something about it costing. Maybe it's something about us that we all like to wear hair shirts a little bit or something like that, but... Somewhere along the line, you know, it's, it's worth it when we give it away and it's cost us something. Now, in saying that, I'm very conscious that some people will automatically feel bad that they've done something that didn't cost them. But don't feel bad about that. But David once said, Lord, 
I don't want to offer anything to you that has not cost me something. And there's something about the uh, self-sacrifice that is important. So he did it in simplicity, sincerity, self-sacrifice. Now, mark these against what's going to come in a minute. Why did he do it? Well, the first thing was he saw the need. He saw the need. Now, you don't have to have an angelic help desk or you don't have to have flashing lights before you do some things. You do some things because you see the need. There's a need there, you want to meet it. And if you have a heart to do that and follow the Lord, you'll see things. Now, some are more observant than others. I'm not always terribly observant, I'm told. So sometimes we need reminding, but we see a need. And that's what he did. He saw the need. There's these people, they're brothers and sisters in Christ. He didn't know a great theology. It only just happened. He didn't know all about Pentecost. He couldn't stand there and preach about what Pentecost and Calvary and all those things, what they're all about. It, all I know is I've surrendered my life to God. He's doing a work. He's pouring out his spirit. And I want to be part of it. And there's a need here amongst those others that are now maybe running out of money, running out of something. Somewhere to stay. Who knows? But he saw the need. That's the first thing. The second thing is very important. He sensed the general mind and will of the Spirit. As I say, you don't need flashing lights. Hello? I've been repeated over here. <laughs> but he sensed the mind of the Spirit. And there is the general mind and will of the Spirit of God that... that we bask in, we know. So, yes, sometimes God speaks to you directly, do such and such, or do it. But sometimes you just know that the mind of the Spirit is to do, to bless, to work, to whatever. And we have to acknowledge that. You know, that you, you, just, you can go in a meeting sometimes, you don't know anything specific that's happening, but you know God's at work. And his general work is to meet people's needs to heal maybe to do this whatever it is and he knew and he sensed the general mind and will of the spirit and we need to be keen to do those things don't forget that it says in Hebrews that you learn by experience in these things of what the spirit's doing so he saw the need and he sensed the general mind and will of the spirit and the third thing was this he was totally sold out to God from the beginning he totally sold out. I don't know if he had other property. I don't know if he had other money. I don't know anything about him. We don't know that much. But he was totally sold out for God. And in a way, these things are a progressing, progression. You see the need, you sense the will of the Spirit, and you want to be sold out, and so you want to be part of it and throw yourself into it. Now, the beginning for us means today. So God wants to have you as a sold-out individual today. That's what he wants to do. To do what he wants. To be one of those who hear what the Spirit is saying. We need to be a church that does that. We need to sense what God is saying and doing. It's not always easy in leadership. When you're leading the church, it's a bit like herding cats. All right? And... Everyone's got their own view and how things should go and will go and all the rest of it. But we need wisdom in these things. That's very important. But as a church, we need to know and acknowledge God's at work. Now, I happen to think we're in a, new, in a season at the moment of God working and doing things. I don't know what you think. Yeah. But God seems to be on the move. Where is he going? I'm not sure. We're, our job is to follow. But... God's at work and he's stirring our hearts. And if you, may, if you find a stirring inside that says, well, I, I don't know where I'm going, but, but I want to go there, that's God at work. And I think we need to see that. Now, I'd like to go down into chapter 5 of Acts because we have the, the contrast, shall we say. And the two events are linked. There's, there's a reason the two things are put together. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira 
sold a piece of property. I have to tell you that a friend of mine w preached at a wedding and he, he wanted to talk about Priscilla and Aquila. But he got mixed up and he said, I want you to be like Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> and he preached this whole sermon on this and kept mentioning this. People were scratching their head wondering what he was getting at, but it was just a mix up. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. So far, so good. The same thing as Barnabas had done. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? After it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you've conceived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came over all who heard of it. The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. I wonder what Peter felt it did for his ministry. <laughs> this is a very strange story. They did the same deed, but they did it from an entirely different motive. Now, take note of this. At no point were they obliged to give all their money to Peter. There was no pressure on them to do anything. They could give a little or a lot. The problem is not how much they gave. The problem was that they lied about it. That's the issue, that they lied about it. So if they wanted to sell it and keep some of the money back to pay for their daughter's wedding, buy themselves a car, should be interesting in those days. <laughs> Any of those sort of things, that's fine. That's up to them to do. But they lied and said, this is the total amount we got <coughs> and we're giving it all. They wanted to be in the action, but no commitment. Mm. That's what happened. They wanted to be there, to be seen, to be doing the same thing, but no commitment, no reality in the thing. So instead of giving with simplicity, it was complicated. They worked out a little plan. Look, I'll tell Peter that we sold it for X amount and you know the same and, uh, you know, we'll do that. Why did they do that? I don't know why they did that. I've no idea. But instead of the simplicity of giving, it was complicated. The whole thing was complicated. Instead of sincerity, really it was contemptuous their attitude towards everyone and the, po the people there, bless their heart in the first place that they wanted to give, but they didn't have to lie about it. And instead of self-sacrifice, it seemed to be with self-concern. So that's what happened. They weren't like Barnabas, who was totally sold out from the beginning. In fact, they seemed to be compromised to the end. This is a very strange story, but you have to put the two next to each other. The simplicity of Barnabas, the complication of Ananias and Sapphira, and to, to run through those things, the sincerity and self-sacrifice. So really what I want to bring to you today is what does it mean to be sold out from the beginning like Barnabas? What does it mean? Well, we have to start with the gospel, and we need to know what the gospel is. You need to understand what the gospel is. 
if you're going to go out on knocking on doors or take, going on evangelism, you must know what the gospel is clearly. When I was a very young Christian, I went and knocked on, on some doors. And this lady, she was a Roman Catholic, actually. She, she, I, I told her that she needed to be saved in a delicate way, the way you do. You know, here's a tract that says you're going to hell unless you, uh, you, you join me, you see. Um, anyway, this lady started taking me up on one, one or two things that I said. And she mentioned Melchizedek. And I said, Mel who? She <laughs> said, Melchizedek. You understand about the priesthood of Melchizedek? No, I don't believe that's in the Bible. I learned the hard way. But she knew much more than I did. So if you're going to know the, uh, go around the doors or preach on the streets or anything like that, know what the gospel is in its simplicity. The first thing is it starts with separation of God and man. And that's where it, it happened in the garden. If you're someone who says, I, I, I struggle, or you talk to someone who says, I struggle with the idea of Adam and Eve, it doesn't matter. The principle is there, that something came between God and man. And that something that came down between God and man was sin. And that sin separated us from God. The next thing we find is that man fails to obtain righteousness, in other words, to atone for this, to deal with this sin. God can't get rid of the wall of sin that separates man and God, all right? Man can't do anything about it. God steps in and makes a promise. I'll do something about it. You can't do it, I will. So God says that he'll do it, he'll redeem us. How does he do it? By sending his son, Jesus Christ to come to live amongst us so we should understand who he is and know who he is. It must have been fabulous to see his ministry. If only they'd realised at the time who was there. Don't you think that would have been wonderful? I'd love to be there and just watch some of these things. But I think had I been there, I would probably would have been in the same state as all of them, which was mystified. But Jesus comes... And his earthly ministry proves to everyone who he is. He's God here on earth. Then we have Calvary, where men say, effectively, you and I say, we will not have this man to rule over us. So we'd rather put him on a cross. There's people in Russia today that are protesting about what's going on in the war. They don't want it. But there weren't many people protesting when they put Jesus on the cross. They, they were saying, we won't have this man to rule over us. <coughs> Calvary happens. The blood of Jesus Christ is shed for your sin and mine and removes that barrier that comes down between God and man. Removes that for those that believe. Then comes, three days later, the resurrection. Praise the Lord. Jesus comes back. He proves that he's the Lord of life and death because he conquers death and he comes back. And you have these lo lovely scenes. It's interesting, isn't it? Who does Jesus first appear to? The women. It's the women. Because the women seem to have a better understanding than the men. Perhaps the men were all wrapped up in their theology and their ideas of what was going to happen and now it's all been dashed. Faithful Mary standing there. Jesus appears. She eventually twigs who it is. And then she won't let go of him. She's flung her arms around him. She's hanging on for dear life. You've gone once, you're never going to go again. Can you imagine Peter or James doing that? John might have done, but the others didn't. But Jesus has to say to her, look, let me go. I've got to go to the Father. I'll be back, don't worry. But that's what happened. Resurrection. Then Jesus says, wait in Jerusalem. 40 days. How do, can you imagine it? Waiting there for 40 days, thinking, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? All that time, Jesus is, or up until the time that he goes to glory, he's teaching them things. Must have been fabulous to hear those things. And then 
comes Pentecost. The Holy Spirit poured out. The Holy Spirit came to bring the life of Jesus to you and me. We cannot live it without the life of Jesus coming by the Holy Spirit. He comes and lives in us and, boy, changes us. Of course, what he does say is you take up your cross. You'll have to take up your cross because they hated me, they'll hate you. But you go out and you preach the gospel and those that believe are going to get saved. They were totally sold out. One of the things that I, I often say to young Christians is, or people that are going from one job to another or something like that, nail your colours to the mast as soon as you possibly can. You know what that means. You're putting your flag up so everyone knows who you are. Do it as soon as you can. It will solve a lot of problems for you. People won't expect to tell you a dirty joke if they know you're a Christian. They won't expect you to lie if they know you're a Christian. Don't do it and you'll solve, you'll solve some problems. It may be difficult. I don't go charging in with a T-shirt with repent written across it on your first day in the office. But let people know who you are. You're someone who loves Jesus and loves them and cares about them. And it will solve a lot of problems you won't, won't be asked to do. Um, pressures and difficulties. So burn your boats when you go somewhere. Burn your boats so you can't go back. Be sold out. Put up a sign under new management. That's what you do. The Lordship of Christ. When I spend some more time with Barnabas, we'll look at the mark of the man himself. And at some stage, we'll perhaps look at what he did in the Acts of the Apostles because it's very significant. But the question is today, is Jesus Lord in your life? Is he Lord? Are you living with simplicity, sincerity, self-sacrifice? Or have you got a life full of complications, contempt, compromise, self-concern? You know, uh, a northerner once said, if you want to improve your memory, lend money. No northerners here, I see. But lend money. You know, if you want to Follow the Lord, stick close to the Lord and be sold out completely. Be sold out in simplicity, sincerity, self-sacrifice. I'll just leave you with a thought. If you're a monk and, you know, I worked with a man for 20 odd years and he'd been to my house <clears throat> I preached the gospel to him loads of times and he said to me one day you know this is after many years he said I, I thought you were a monk I said Jim how can I be a monk I'm married with three children how can I be a monk he said I don't know I just thought that you used to go home take your suit off put on a habit and <laughs> I don't know if you thought I put a donut on my head, you know, with a sort of bald pot, bit in the middle. So, anyway, I never quite got over that. Um, but, you know, if you were a monk, and I don't see any monks or nuns here, they'd give you a new name when you became whatever. You became such and such. You, you took a name. What name would you give yourself? What name would you give yourself? I assume that you had a, have a choice in it. I don't, I don't know. Not being a monk, for anyone who's worried about it, I don't know. But what name would you give yourself? You see, the, the apostles called Barnabas a son of encouragement. He was an encourager. And when we go through some later things at a later time, you'll see why. He was called the son of encouragement. What name would you give yourself? Or, this is more difficult, 
What name do you think other people would give you? Son of encouragement? Kind person? Misery guts? <laughs> That's you, right. Okay. But what name would you give yourself? You know, the Lord's going to give us a new name. That's what the scripture says. But what name would you give yourself? Would you be someone who just lives with sin sincerity and self-sacrifice and all of those things? I want to exhort you to do those things. You know, I said that I think that God is moving, he's doing things, and it starts with us saying, Lord, you come and work something in my heart that changes me. You may think that you're a changed person already, and you should be. If you've been in, in the Lord for years, you should be changed. But there's always room for more change. You know, the Bible's full of conundrums. It talks about that we have everything we could ever need in Christ, yet there's more to come. How does that work? I don't know. But you've got everything in Christ, but there's more to come. Let's just pray, shall we? <coughs> Father, these are difficult days we're living in. We don't know what's going to happen. And we prayed about the nations, Lord, and we want to pray now that you'd make us people with a name for peace and love and joy and long-suffering and all those things that are there, the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, we want to pray that you'd challenge us and change us. Lord, we're open to you to do what you need to do. And we, we pray, Lord, where we're strong, Lord, strengthen us. Where we're weak, strengthen us. Make us those that are like the people we see here in the Scriptures, self-sacrifices, their, their way of living with sincerity and simplicity. Lord, make us like that. And Lord, while we give you a moment, we pray that you'll speak to our hearts. Let's just take a moment and ask the Lord what he wants to say to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let the Spirit of God just whisper in your heart what he wants to do, what he wants to change, what he wants to strengthen. He may stretch you as well. Bless your name, Lord. We worship you. We worship you, Lord. You know, the answer is to say yes to God. Whatever he says to you, Lord, the answer is always, yes, Lord. I'll do it. I'll be it. I'll be open to you to change. You can't change unless the Spirit of God changes you and enables you. You're cast upon him. That's why it's self-sacrificing. You're giving of yourself to the Lord because we can trust the Lord to look after us. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you for speaking to us. Continue to do so as we worship, Lord. Glorify the name of Jesus here. We love you, Lord. You've been so good to us. We just look to you, Lord, to keep us and to keep our eyes focused upon you. Single, as the word says. Single-eyed, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name. We'll have a time when you can have prayer if you want to, if you want to come out whilst the worship's continuing and you've got a need, a desire for something, then we'll pray for you. Father, we give you thanks. And all the people said...